inaugural lecture, lectures, as you know, are a central part of university life, indeed of university academic life. The inaugural lecturer is saying to us, um, I have made it to this, the top bench uh, of what a university academic life is about. And this is what I do. This is what brought me here. Um, so it's a great celebration for the uh, inaugural lecturer, the new professor himself or herself, and of course their family and friends. But the lecturer is saying something else uh, to us as well on these occasions, because it is to say, this is my work and this is how I got here. But this time, they have to do it for a slightly more public platform or from a slightly more public platform to tell us what they do in ways that uh, even those of us who are not in the discipline will understand. Mohammed Farid Jibai was born in Lanasia to Ahmed and Jubaida Jibai. Uh, the middle child with three sisters and two brothers, Mohammed spent his early years schooling in Lens, as Lanasia was called. Though neither Muhammad nor his dad were aware of it at the time, his outdoor expeditions with his dad were to spark the interest which would later inform what has become his outstanding academic career. For the greatest joy that Muhammad and his dad that Muhammad shared with his dad was camping and fishing in the many dams and rivers of the then Transvaal. And during these trips, perhaps as a lack of success with catching live fish, <laughs> there was much eating of tinned fish. <laughs> so Mr. Jiba, I want to thank you very much on behalf of the university and the faculty for getting Mohammed interested in fish so many years ago. <laughs> because it's this fishy theme that has now become one of his major targets in his research. Other aspects of his childhood and youth which were to influence his later life, were his school and his teachers. Muhammad really <coughs> wanted to be a teacher, but both his dad and his favorite English teacher suggested that it would be more appropriate for him to do medicine. So in true Muhammad style, being the polite person that he is, <laughs> he said okay to please them. <laughs> and he then registered for medicine um, at what was then known as UNB, Un University of Natal, where he lived in the infamous Alan Taylor residence for most of his medical school years. And probably his most interesting work in recent years has been the exploring the allergies that plague workers who process fish, an interest that is not only taking him back to his childhood, eating those tin pilchards with his dad on the Artebius Boat Dam, but has also taken him around the world, invited to talk in places as far afield as Goa, in Labrador. So uh, it's, it's really about tracing um, the seafood from when it's harvested uh, in the, from the sea right up to when it lands on the table and following the fish as it goes along and the processes that fish undergo before we actually get to consume it. And so that's what I meant by from farm to fork. Um, and in the process uh, what I'm trying to highlight is that in, in, in times gone by, uh, people ate a lot of fresh food, and including seafood. And now um, food is characterized by a lot of processing. And in, and, and in the process, um, the, the natural um, product is actually um, changed. The, the, the fish can become more allergenic and people who uh, eat or inhale the seafood can become allergic to it. So that was basically what the title is about. Um, I'm more interested in, in um, risk factors that deal with inhaling uh, allergens. Now most of us know that people who eat seafood can become allergic to it, uh, but very little is known about people who, who may be accidentally inhaling uh, these allergens like seafood and whether they can become allergic to it. And so I found that a workplace is a good place where you can actually research such a question. Our studies along the West Coast show that almost 70% of workers, mostly women, had a seasonal employment status, and that these seasonal workers 
were twice as likely to report work-related symptoms. We also found that women employed primarily in canning operations were more likely to develop asthma symptoms and airway hyperresponsiveness due to the gender distribution of work. In many parts of the world, a large proportion of the fishermen are migrant workers employed by large fishing companies of the north to work on vessels for long periods of time away from home. This is reminiscent of the way in which South Africa's gold mining industry was built on the sweat and labor of migrant mine workers from remote rural settings and neighboring countries. The important thing is to prevent exposure and thus we developed uh, these kind of recommendations to the workplaces and in fact some of them already started implementing the, uh, these interventions even though we hadn't yet completed the study. So again, it raised awareness amongst the workers. While we tested over 600 workers uh, from uh, two big plants in St. Helena Bay and that's the big sort of the epicenter of uh, fish uh, uh, processing in the West Coast. Employers who uh, are actually have a lot of resources are able to implement the interventions uh, or some of them much more easily than the kind of smaller workplaces where conditions are in fact worse uh, and uh, you know there are more challenges in terms of financial ability to actually uh, improve on the workplaces. It's my philosophical approach to life is that you know it's all about social justice and about addressing the inequities in health uh, which is just a reflection of the way society is structured. And so I think public health provides an important vehicle to address some of these inequities, these structural factors that affect people's health, such as work. Uh, because a lot of the work that we do is ultimately uh, influenced by the policies and the politics of the day. Um, and so being able to be in a position where I have access to um, you know, all the information resources and also in an in influential position where I'm able to develop policy and influence government policies and regulations and laws. Uh, that this is, this is what I'm, I enjoy and this is what really puts my research into action as it were. So I think public health has um, a lot to offer uh, in terms of uh, you know improving the health status of people and specifically occupational health uh, uh, has a lot to offer in terms of dealing with improving the working conditions of people creating decent work. I would like to acknowledge all those that have contributed towards nurturing my passion in fulfillment of my dreams and aspirations along this journey. A hearty thanks to my colleague and friend, immunologist Andreas Lopata, now living in Australia, who could not be with us here today, to all the workers and my patients. I have come to learn, know and appreciate your struggle and toil through working with you. Whether you work thousands of meters underground, unearthing its mineral wealth to build our country, till the soil or fish the seas to bring forth food to stir our hunger, or work in the factories night and day, sewing the cloths that adorn our bodies. I remember you all. My intellectual efforts pale in comparison to your hard work. Your struggle and toil has and will always leave an indelible mark on my consciousness. It's really been a pleasure for me to walk alongside Mohammed to see him elected to council, to gaining his exceptionally well-deserved ad hominem promotion to full professor, his NRF rating, but also to see his happiness in his family and his relationships around him, and also simply to have him as a friend. His path has not been dissimilar to mine, though he might still be holding a little against me for having been an active member of the National Medical and Dental Association at the time <laughs> of anti-apartheid mobilisation. But in all he does, 
He has embodied the, the socially responsive academics that our university seeks to encourage and who should serve as a role model for our students. Our students should know and value the fact that Muhammad gave freely of his time to assist the victims of the Makassar sulphur fire, claim their rights to redress and compensation. For me, I think we, uh, when I read his profile and the invitation um, to the inaugural, I also went, wow, you really have done a lot, you know, because I think one experiences the person in your life um, in components. So, so you see the masters and the PhD and you live through it together and you, you know, you engage with that and you celebrate those accomplishments as they go and you hear about the Senate and you hear about this and that and all of the organizations that happen, but they're not focal points in our, in our conversation to that extent. Um, so, so I think the inauguration was just this um, overall picture of this person and how much he has accomplished very quietly throughout his career. And so uh, in a funny way, as much as everybody else went, wow, you, you know, you've done a lot, which was my family's responses when they saw and, and read what he had done. I also did it and went, oh honey, you actually really did do a lot, eh? When did you have time to do all of this? <laughs> so, yeah, and I think it was um, also a sense of... I think Mohammed has this incredible, incredibly unique kind of capacity to have deep compassion as a, as a human quality and to wed that compassion to the kind of work he does. Um, and I think that's very unique. I think that he, his work is saturated by a deep sense of human compassion and a desire to feed into a society and to human well-being. Uh, and I think it's the, the kind of the fortitude and the commitment and the perseverance with which he pursues his work uh, in the service of other human beings is testimony to that. So, um, you know, he's a wonderful human being, um, just a lovely friend and somebody that I, um, you know, if you have to choose, you know, a couple of friends in your life that you think um, really are solid, and uh, kind of have got your back, Muhammad would be one of the ones that I would choose. Well, I think it was actually quite, a, quite an interesting experience and quite cathartic on some level. My family um, could, could really not get to grips with what I am or what I do uh, because the kind of traditional stereotype of a doctor is someone who's, who sees patients and who has a surgery and that's what he does. Uh, but trying to understand someone who's doing research uh, in the medical field is a bit more challenging and then occupational medicine is even more challenging. So I think for them to be able, they hear me sort of going to all these conferences presenting papers but they actually never get to hear me speaking. So I think for them it was, it was very nice to, uh, to for them to, to sit and listen to, to, to what I had to say. It was very challenging though because I had to try and translate all these scientific concepts into an, a more accessible uh, medium so that they could also um, understand it. And then obviously for, the, for those who, t who could totally not understand what I was having to say, I had to kind of create the visuals to make it even sort of more captivating on that level. So I think it was a kind of a rite of passage for me. Um, for my family so that yeah I am and this is what I do and this is my home, my academic home and this is what I do every day uh, and also from the university side is, is saying while well, I've arrived at UCT I have been a reliant on soft funded uh, projects for many years and so being able to have a permanent position uh, at a uh, top-class university um, in this country and, and in Africa is for me says a lot just for myself because I'm always continually trying to benchmark myself and uh, it's great to know that I'm welcome in, into such an institution and fully embraced for what I'm able to do. Mm -hmm.